but it was just sitting there in the middle of the desert, and he was astounded uh, by this sight. So he decided to go closer, and uh, but uh, anyway, when he got to about uh, well, you know, about 250 feet in front of that object, uh, suddenly he saw coming out of the hatch of that uh, craft, coming out of the hatch were two entities that he thought were wearing some white coveralls, and uh, but uh, these two entities were somewhat, you know, short, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, four feet tall or something like that. Aloha and welcome to another show, guys. Today I have a truly fascinating guest with us, someone who has spent decades delving into the mysterious and often controversial world of UAPs. Norio Hayakawa, he is a seasoned researcher, investigator, a lecturer with a rich history of exploring government secrecy and UAP sightings. Norio has been involved in this field since the 1960s and he has investigated some of the most compelling incidents, including Area 51 and Dolce Base. He's also known for his critical perspective on the nature of these phenomena, suggesting that they might be manipulated by a deceptive entities from another dimension. But before we go into our wonderful interview, I want to thank all of my YouTube and podcast Ohana and I want to ask all of my YouTube and podcast Ohana, it's really important that you follow the podcast and give a positive rating. Your help brings more incredible guests like Norio Hayakawa, L.A. Marzuli, Ryan Peterson, Gary Wayne. They're all excited to join us because they see that there is an engaged audience out there. So by following and reviewing, you're helping grow our Ohana and to bring even more fascinating content and remarkable guests to the show. So please, if you can, possibly give a positive rating. I would truly appreciate it. Okay, now without further ado, let's welcome Norio Hayakawa to the show. Well, thank you very much. Um, hajime mashite yoroshiku. Uh, <laughs> あの、あまりわかりませんでもあの、うちの母は日本人でサッポロから来ました。あ、そうですか。すごくよく話せますね、日本語。のわかりませんも、あ、悪い。日本語悪い。あ、そうなのね。もう、もう、thank uh, yes, um, you're welcome. You're a very interesting man. Um, oh, I listened to your interview with on Coast to Coast, um, Derek Gilbert. Uh, I see. Oppenheimer. Yeah, you're you're very interesting, and you're from Yokohama. That's correct. And yeah, so my family's from Sapporo, Hokkaido. Oh. So <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if you could please tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. I, I know a little bit about you, but I'm not sure what the audience knows about you and how you came to New Mexico, of all places. It's a very long story, but, uh, you know, I was born and raised in Yokohama, Japan. Actually, I was born in 1944, so I'm a very, very old guy, almost 80-year-old. And about anyway... I grew up in Yokohama, Japan, and I went to an international type of school from grade one all the way to high school, grade 12. And so, you know, so I, uh, by the time I was in uh, second grade, I, I started understanding a little bit of English 
In fact, when I first went to that international school, you know, they only spoke English and you were not allowed to speak Japanese at all. But anyway, uh, you know, things are, you know how things are, you just get used to it. So by the second grade, I was almost, uh, you know, I stood, understood everything they were talking about and so but anyway i graduated from that international uh, school in yokohama in 1963 and then uh, the following year i decided to go to a university in tokyo called the sophia university in tokyo japan and uh, it was in 1964, in the month of April of 1964, that I was in a student lounge at the Sophia University in Tokyo, and I was just relaxing and reading some newspapers. And, uh, you know, there were uh, some English language newspapers there. So I was looking at this newspaper, and lo and behold, there was a strange headline in the middle of this newspaper. It wasn't a big article, but it said, patrol officer sees saucer sitting on the sand. What a strange uh, headline that was. And uh, I was interested in that, that headline. And uh, so I decided to read that news article. And it said, uh, from Socorro, New Mexico, which I had never even heard of until then. So I started reading that amazing news story that uh, came from AP Wires, and uh, lo and behold, it was a fascinating story, news story, of a highway patrol officer living in a small town called Socorro, New Mexico, uh, you know, and uh, it was, uh, I believe, at April 24th, 1964, uh, on that afternoon, he was chasing a high-speed, uh, you know, motor vehicle. And, uh, but anyway, uh, after a few minutes, he stopped chasing that high-speeder because he had heard a loud explosion in the desert. So he stopped chasing that car and went towards the desert. And uh, Lord behold, he witnessed something strange. That is, he witnessed about uh, 300 to 400 feet uh, ahead of him, a strange oval-shaped metallic object just sitting on tripod right in the desert and it was the size of a regular automobile maybe slightly larger but it was just sitting there in the middle of the desert and he was astounded uh, by this sight so he decided to go closer and uh, but uh, anyway when he got to about uh, well you know about 250 feet in front of that object uh suddenly he saw coming out of the hatch of that uh craft coming out of the hatch were two entities that he thought were wearing some white coveralls and uh, but uh, these two entities were somewhat you know short like uh, i don't know like uh four feet tall or something like that and yet uh he's he um, he thought they were uh, just uh, regular people but that they were short and wearing some kind of a coverall, a white kind of a coverall. And soon these two strange entities realized that they were being observed by this patrol officer 300 feet away. And so they, well, they went inside the hatch 
close that hatch and within less than a 30 seconds, Officer Lonnie Samora heard a loud explosion and, uh, you know, and uh, the bottom of that craft was, uh, you know, was ejecting some kind of a, you know, a thing like fiery thing. And then this object rose up in the air and then it flew up towards the the, the western sky, and suddenly, at a tremendous rate of speed, it just vanished. In other words, Officer Lonnie Samora says the object did not fly away in a regular uh, propulsion system, but it simply dematerialized into the air, you know, and so, that was the famous 1964 Lonnie Zamora Socorro incident, which is one of the most credible UFO incidents in American history. It was investigated by hundreds of uh, personnel from uh, yeah, Holloman Air Force Base, which is about which was about 200 miles south of the Socorro area. But, uh, you know, I'm talking about a day or even a day later or two days. Not only were the Air Force personnel from Holman Air Force Base descended on this town of Socorro to see the site, uh, but uh, there were also people, government officials from Washington, D.C., that it joined them. In fact, one of the uh, persons that was sent from Washington, D.C. was, uh, of course, the famous J. Allen Hynek. And J. I. Allen Hynek and several others thoroughly investigated that location. The, they witnessed uh, uh, remaining, uh, you know, burning of the bushes and uh, the charred remains of, you know, this rocks in the desert and the indentations of where the tripod was allegedly, uh, you know, there. And so the conclusion is that Dr. J. Allen Hynek and many others said this was definitely. Uh, one of the most amazing incidents he had seen and the most credible because of the person of Lonnie Samora, a highly respected patrol officer. And so I was just absolutely stunned by looking at this uh, newspaper article from New Mexico, which was in a Japanese newspaper, you know, I think it was Japan Times or something, English language paper uh, in 1964, in April 24th. So I was just fascinated by this incident and by the state of New Mexico. I had really had no interest in New Mexico, I had much less because I didn't know where it was. Uh, I knew that maybe I, it was part of the US. But anyway, uh, coincidentally, coincidentally, right after I uh, graduated from uh, the International High School in Yokohama, Japan, I wrote a letter to uh, admissions of uh, New Mexico's uh, University of Albuquerque. Uh, and uh, in 1965, the following year, after the Lonnie Zamora incident, in 1965, believe it or not, I got a partial scholarship at this college in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I mean, that was almost like a miracle. And I don't believe in coincidences. I think it was a destiny. So I came to this amazing state of New Mexico, USA, for the first time, directly from Japan, actually, 
by way of uh, Los Angeles. And then I landed uh, in 1965 at Albuquerque's uh, airport. And, uh, you know, that was in 1965, I think around July, because the college was going to start from September. And uh, so anyway, I landed at this very small airport that was then uh, Albuquerque Airport. And, uh, uh, you know, they didn't have anything sophisticated like not right now. So they, they had to use uh, the, the steps outside the airplane, you know. And then I stepped out and the first thing I noticed was the absolutely deep blue skies. I have never experienced in my life. So that was my, uh, you know, land uh, of enchantment experience. First time uh, that I had ever seen such a deep blue sky. So that's why I fell in love with the state of New Mexico. That was 1965. And right now, I'm living right here in this amazing state of New Mexico, the land of enchantment, in truly fullest sense of the word, it is enchanted. And it is one of the most, well, strange and mysterious places in America that I can think of. And so there, right here I am, right here in New Mexico. And you know, in the beginning, I, I, I got involved with my studies, uh, my studies, uh, you know, at college. So I wanted to meet this Lonnie Zamora officer, but uh, I couldn't do it because I was, became so involved in studies. And by the way, I majored in Spanish language because uh, I wanted to become a Spanish language teacher in a school. And so I graduated uh, from this University of Albuquerque in 1970. And uh, I became a high school Spanish instructor in Arizona. And, uh, you know, that was in 1973. And, uh, you know, and so New Mexico has always been part of my life. And uh, this is where I will die right here. I will be buried in this land of enchantment. But, you know, uh, after that, I, I moved to Arizona, uh, you know, from New Mexico. And as I said, I became a high school Spanish teacher in a small rural town right next to Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I taught Spanish high school. And then, uh, you know, later on, uh, I don't know, I, I was interested in music because I was a musician and uh, I joined a country western band while I was in Phoenix and, uh, you know, I was uh, into country western music and also New Mexico type, uh, you know, music. Uh, and so I joined this country western band in Phoenix and then I, uh, we traveled to Canada and all that. And, uh, you know, those were the days of my uh, adventures. But uh, eventually I left Arizona and moved to Los Angeles for the first time in 1982. Uh, for the first time I moved to Los Angeles. Then I was looking for a job one day and I went to the employment agency and they told me that there is a job opening at uh, a small area called Little Tokyo area of Los Angeles where Japanese businesses were there, you know. So I went to this place and uh, Lord behold, it was a funeral home. And uh, they were actually looking for a person to stay there at night and answer the phones at the funeral home. So I took that job because I needed a place to stay. And that was the beginning of my many, many years of this career as a funeral director. 
And uh, so later on, I became a licensed funeral director in Los Angeles, and I did that for almost uh, 30 years. And coincidentally, but I don't believe the word coincidence, but while I was working in that funeral home in 1989, I was just uh, relaxing in the morgue of that uh, funeral home because it was quiet. Uh, there were only about 26 uh, people just sleeping, so-called. <laughs> and I was listening to a radio in the morgue around 2 o'clock in the morning, and there was this uh, radio talk show coming from Las Vegas. That was in 1989. And I was listening to that talk show, and there was an interesting guest who claimed that he was a scientist who was working at a secret facility in Nevada. And of course, everybody knows now that it was Bob Lazar who was appearing on a talk show in Las Vegas in 1989. And he claimed that he was working on a reverse engineering program of a strange alien craft that was transported from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in around 1952 or 19, no, 1955, and was transferred to this facility called Area 51. And that was the claim of Mr. Bob Lazar. So I was fascinated with Mr. Bob Lazar, the scientist who was working on an alien spacecraft at a secret facility in Nevada. I was just uh, fascinated with this and I, decided that I got to get to this bottom of this thing. And so I wrote about this into a, to a Japanese magazine in, uh, right away. And then in 1990, the Japanese magazine called Mu, M-U, just like the Mu continent, the Japanese magazine about the occult events in the world. This magazine sent me a writer to cover this story. And uh, so this writer also contacted the Japanese television uh, program people. And so these Japanese Nippon television people came along with this writer and we all went to Mr. Babuza's house on uh, Wednesday, February the 21st of uh, 1990, and that was the start of my fascination with this secret program at the secret uh, facility called Area 51, and that was 1989. So, you know, uh, I have a long, long history of, uh, you know, researching about Area 51, even uh, from 1989, and, you know, and uh, later on, I took many journalists to the perimeters of this strange facility. But uh, later on, as the years went by, I began to realize that maybe there was nothing alien about Area 51. Maybe it was just uh, good old American technology. And so, you know, I started uh, getting into this but yet, at the same time, I kept my belief that I had from my father's account. I forgot to let you know that while I was growing up in Japan as a small child, you know, in the 1950s, my father used to tell us about his sighting of a strange ball of fire, greenish ball of fire, just slowly maneuvering over the Bay of Yokohama one night after midnight. It was around two o'clock, but he swears, he swore that he had seen a strange ball of greenish ball of fire slowly maneuvering over the Bay of Yokohama. And he said it was in the summer of 1947. And uh, as I told you, uh, he was telling us about that, his experience while I was growing up, you know, he told us 
my sister and my mother and but uh, uh, you know my mother was kind of skeptical about that as well as my sister but I was a firm believer I thought that he did see what he described then as a flying saucer and that was you know I was growing up and uh, so you know I never abandoned my belief in the reality of this strange phenomenon that I call the UFO phenomenon. And uh, even to this day, I'm a firm believer that we live in a world that, uh, that uh, not only, uh, you know, has seen physical things, but non-physical things could exist with us even right now. And that's my position. Right now, my position as a resident of this very important city called Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, which has the, one of the most important Air Force bases in America namely Kirtland Air Force Base, right here in Albuquerque, and also Albuquerque where the Air Force Research Laboratory is located, and also very important contractor called the Sandia Labs are located inside this uh, Air Force Base. And Albuquerque is only about, you know, an hour, 20 minutes away from another important location called Los Alamos National Laboratories, where the world's leading edge biogenetic research is going on, as well as research on weapon systems as well. So we're living right now in this state, which is the fifth largest state in the United States, but yet, the population, the entire population of this amazing state is only 2 million. And it has been this for many, many years. So this is a, a very convenient place for the United States military to do a lot of uh, weapons research, uh, testing, and everything that you can think of. And in fact, New Mexico has the leading state-of-the-art technology right now in so far as directed energy weapon systems, which are being conducted at Kirtland Air Force Base through the Air Force Research Laboratory, as well as the uh, White Sands National, uh, you know, uh, White Sands Missile Range, only about 250 miles south of Albuquerque. So, this is the most important location you can ever think of in America right now for defense uh, research. And uh, I think uh, this has something to do, I think, with the so-called strange phenomenon that I refer to as the UFO phenomenon. And it's, this is the reality. We don't know much even now, we don't know much about the real nature of this strange phenomenon. And this is the main reason why the Pentagon has refused to make any comments about this UFO phenomenon, because they themselves have always been perplexed by this phenomenon. And so they've been, you know, researching this strange phenomenon since... Uh, you know, since everything started, since 1947, especially in the modern period. And yet, the Air Force and the U.S. military don't have the answer to this problem, and they are just as perplexed. And uh, this is the reason why they cannot make any comments about this phenomenon, which goes beyond our... Uh, you know, uh, scientific uh, methodology of investigation. And so this is where it stands. Even right now, it goes on and on with no answer. And that's the very summary of where I stand, you know, this. 
And you consider yourself an American activist and served as maybe even still currently serve as a director of Citizen Intelligent Network. Um, yep. It's like the loosely knit citizen oversight committee on government um, accountabil accountability. That's correct. Um, yeah, in 1990, while well, I became involved in the Area 51 research, uh, going to that uh, Nevada site for many, many times, I started to form a group called the Civilian Intelligence Net Network in order to create a group that is vital to act as a watchdog agency uh, for government programs because there are indeed the things called black budget programs in the United States where, you know, things could go wrong, you know, they could destroy environment and they have actually. Uh, the So we decided to form a group to monitor the activities of these uh, so-called black budget programs of the uh, military to make sure they are not doing anything that is violating the protection of the, uh, you know, environment. So yes, I formed that organization in 1990, and we became active in uh, many of the researches. But uh, of course, uh, by now it has been dissolved. There's no such a thing, but just a few people remain and we just exchange information about what's going on. And we just uh, use the internet to, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, the propagate uh, facts uh, of uh, everything to the people. So uh, anytime new information comes, we pass along uh, freely. Uh, this kind of information because uh, you know I believe in our hard-earned tax dollars and we want to make sure that uh, these tax dollars are being used for programs that benefit uh, society, benefit America, you know. And so I think there's a need for oversight committee like this. Yes. Well, what are your thoughts on the idea that the UFO phenomenon represents intentional deception rather than physical ET visitations? Well, I've been involved in the UFO research, UFO phenomenon research for more than 60 years. In fact, I started in 1961 when I was uh, uh, in high school. And so after more than 60 years of research, I have yet to see any uh, physical, tangible, documentary evidence whatsoever that we have ever been visited by physical, extraterrestrial, uh, biological entities in their physical, extraterrestrial spacecraft. I have yet to see any evidence, yet the real phenomena remains. The UFO phenomena still remains unsolved because I have come to the conclusion, like many of the pioneers of American ufology, such as uh, Dr. Jack Vallee, whom I consider to be one of the most uh, foremost authority of this phenomenon. Uh, people like Jacques Vallée and people like uh, John A. Keel, another author. These gentlemen were pioneers of ufology in America, but uh, in the late 1970s, their perspective started changing from extraterrestrial hypothesis of the origin of this phenomenon to non-extraterrestrial physical origin of this phenomenon. So, in fact, uh, I was also uh, influenced by the writings of Dr. Jacques Vallée and uh, 
John A. Keel, and I became a firm believer that this phenomenon is not a hundred percent physical phenomenon. In fact, it's not a physical phenomenon, but it is an intrusion into our physical dimension of uh, sentient entities that dwell in an extra dimension in this cosmos. And they often seem to interact and intrude physically and materialize physically into our dimension uh, for reasons yet unknown. And these entities have the ab ability to pre-select the observers or a group of observers. And so, and then also locations. So this is my conclusion that the UFO phenomenon is a real phenomenon, but uh, we still don't know much about it. And uh, most of the world's scientists and engineers in this world believe that there ought to be somewhere in this vast universes, intelligent life out there. But when it comes to UFOs, they also seem to be convinced that UFOs are not manifestations of their physical visitation to this planet. And I concur with them fully. This is the reason why, even though I have been investigating the so-called alien underground bases, such as they allegedly have right here in New Mexico, about three hours away from Albuquerque, there's a place called Dulce, New Mexico, which is part of the Indian reservation of the Hikari Apache people. But for many years, there have been rumors that there is a physical underground alien U.S. collaborative bio uh, lab outside Dulce under the Archuleta Mesa. But, uh, you know, I've investigated Dulce and even now, once in a while, I visit Dulce. I have made many friends in Dulce because uh, in 1991, this Japanese TV crew, after leaving Area 51, we came to New Mexico right after Area One, uh, Area 51 the following week. And we started interviewing people at this strange uh, Native American community called the, uh, uh, you know, the Dulce, uh, New Mexico. The Dulce was the largest community of the expansive Hikaria Apache Reservation. And we tried to find out if there's a physical underground base there. And even to this day, I have yet to see any physical evidence of any underground alien base in Dulce. But at the same time, I believe in the testimonies of the local residents who claim, even now, who claim to see occasionally strange lights hovering over Dulce and occasionally appearance of military helicopters over Dulce, New Mexico, even today, you know. But yet, I have yet to see any physical evidence. So I'm a firm believer that there is still something going on in the Dulce area, and I like to use the word paraphysical phenomenon rather than the physical phenomenon. It's a paraphysical phenomenon in which entities from another dimension occasionally materialize themselves and appear and interact with the local residents, Native American people in the Dulce area, even now. So, you know, 
as I said, I made a lot of friends in Dulce, and uh, I believe in the testimonies of those uh, Native American folks who claim to have seen things like flying saucers, even now flying sometimes over Dulce, and who claim to even have seen strange entities such as what appears to be a Bigfoot. such as what appears to be a Bigfoot, you know, in near the Navajo River area of Dose. Even, even today, there are reports. So something is definitely going on. This is the reason why I'm so glad to be living here in this strange but wonderful uh, land of enchantment, New Mexico, uh, because... Uh, you know, there's something here, there's something here, and this could be one of the centers of paraphysicality in, in the United States, just as much as uh, places like in Utah, there are strange locations in Utah that seem to have uh, some kind of paraphysical phenomenon. And, uh, you know, so <laughs> New Mexico is definitely one of these areas of uh, attention. Yeah, absolutely. What are your thoughts on the idea that these manipulative entities might be using our beliefs as a psychological weapon? Well, uh, you brought a very good, uh, you know, topic, the psychological operations. And now, psychological operations are conducted not only by the United States military, uh, but also, I believe that these entities also use psyops, psychological operations to manipulate the thoughts of people uh, for some strange reasons. We, we don't know yet for sure, but I believe that, uh, yes. Now, when I'm talking about these entities, I'm not saying that all these entities are malevolent or bad. In fact, I am a firm believer that in this entire cosmos, there are benevolent entities as well as malevolent entities. I believe that the majority, that is to say about two thirds of the entire cosmic uh, sentient uh, entities, uh, are of the benevolent kind. Uh, but a third of these entities in the entire cosmos, I believe are malevolent, who have uh, a negative type of influence in our lives, and uh, they are very deceptive. And uh, the reason I say is that, uh, you know, this belief comes from the belief in spirituality throughout the world. Throughout the world, you can study religious beliefs of uh, various cultures, and many of the religious beliefs of various cultures in the world are similar in a sense that they also believe that there are good entities and bad entities. You know, and this is the reason why, and I have to say, and I can say confidentially, that in the Pentagon in the United States, there are officials, and there are a large number of officials who believe that this entire UFO phenomenon could be uh, 
deceptive phenomena orchestrated by some negative or malevolent entities to deceive mankind or some near future scenarios. And, uh, you know, there are these kind of uh, people in the military who believe in this kind of uh, uh, belief system. And so this is another problem for the United States military, the Pentagon, that it seems to be divided into groups some military officials believe that we are being visited by actual physical aliens in the physical spacecraft. We are being visited right now, or we have always been visited. But uh, there are other military officials who seem to believe that uh, this is just a deception. And so, you know, those... Uh, officials in the Pentagon that seem to believe in this kind of, uh, you know, believe that uh, this is a negative, deceptive type of phenomenon. Uh, they are found uh, among the so-called uh, evangelical type of uh, Christian beliefs that are being held by many in the military, you know. so. Uh, this is the same in the United States without, uh, you don't have to be military, but in the United States, well, you know, everything is, seems to be divided into, even right now. This is why this is very important to approach all of this in a logical, reasonable, common sense approach to this whole phenomenon, you know, that... Uh, there are people in America who believe that we are being visited by space aliens and physical space alien craft. But uh, there are other folks who believe that we are being invaded by not physical entities, but deceptive, non-physical, sentient, malevolent entities who are going to deceive us and create a new kind of system in this world uh, in the very near future. Uh, the, so this is the division. And uh, so in the United States, there are people who believe uh, in so-called conspiracies. Now, as I said, in America, there is a total division of people who believe in conspiratorial thinking and people who don't believe in the conspiratorial thinking, but who take information, uh, you know, believable information and just figure it out. And so, you know, this is the thing. You know, I consider myself not a ufologist per se, because uh, this is not my work. I am not a ufologist by occupation, but uh, because I'm retired, I'm just a, a retired old uh, funeral director. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and uh, also I'm just an entertainer because I play music even right now. I perform live music by going to assisted living facilities in Albuquerque, which there are so many. And then I bring live music to the people who are shut in in these places. And so I uh, get this, uh, you know, satisfaction of providing something positive to these people. So I'm not a professional ufologist, and, uh, but uh, I like to consider myself a conspiratologist. <laughs> which you have never heard of this word because mm -hmm. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm simply a conspiratologist who study the effects of belief in conspiracies, how beliefs in conspiracies can affect society in general. And so that's my uh, real, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, interest. 
uh, in research because, uh, you know, I'm just a human being, no different from any other people. I'm just a regular Joe who is interested, especially in conspiratology. And I think this is a very important subject matter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you believe that the ultimate purpose of these of this phenomena are um, that they are manipulating us as the I guess by these I guess end game their end game is this one world order or something like that. Do you think that's what they're trying to do? These I demons think... or entities. Yes, I think uh, it's very possible because uh, I think uh, my conclusion that in the modern day era, everything started from around 1947 with the so-called, I'm saying so-called Roswell crash that uh, apparently took place uh, in 1947 and also 1947 was the beginning of the brainwashing uh, operation by well unseen secret uh, governmental uh, things that want to brainwash brainwash us into believing that we are being invaded by aliens, and so everything seemed to have started in 1947 with the so-called Roswell crash which was, uh, I think, which was orchestrated to begin this uh, brainwashing system. So 1947 also was when the CIA began, the successor to Office of Special uh, you know, uh, Services, of uh, Strategic Services. Okay, OSS became CIA in 1947. And in 1947, the National Security Agency was born. And in 1947, the Department of the Air Force began. Until 1947, there was no Air Force Department. There was no CIA. There was no NSA. But in 1947, with the beginning of the series of the series of the so-called crashed objects, especially in New Mexico. Uh, it seemed to have begun this uh, operation. And uh, I believe that it could be the entities themselves who staged uh, several crashes on purpose to bring people to the uh, belief that... Uh, uh, you know, we are being invaded and something is going to happen uh, in this uh, generation uh, that will change the world. And so, you know, I have my own opinions on Roswell because uh, Roswell, indeed, something did crash, but not in July. Something did crash on June 14th, 1947, outside of Roswell, outside of Corona, a small community, and it was the crash of a very top secret American uh, reconnaissance item that uh, the United States were, uh, you know, conducting. And it was a high altitude reconnaissance uh, material uh, that were monitoring the Russian or Soviet Union's uh, atomic blasts. And they could do that by launching these uh, very, you know, kind of a very, you know, a very interesting uh, material uh, with this humongous type of new balloons, you know, weather balloons, but it wasn't a weather balloon. It was part of this project, uh, you know, uh, that the U.S. was conducting. But I believe that Somebody had an idea to make this crash of a top secret U.S. program into a flying saucer crash, and it succeeded. It succeeded very much, but in 1947, 
After a few months after the Roswell crash, most people forgot about the Roswell incident because they thought it was just a weather balloon of some kind. So nobody talked about Roswell since 1947 until 1980. In 1980, a researcher by the name of William L. Moore, or Bill Moore, decided to publish a disinformative, partially disinformative book called The Roswell Incident. It came out in 1980. And uh, when the book was published, it became a bestseller. And this was, in 1980, the first time that the subject matter of Roswell was revived. And Bill Moore, in writing this book, he interviewed a lot of people in Roswell, and a lot of people in Roswell uh, who never spoke about the Roswell incident in 1947 or 1948, he ne they never spoke about it because nobody was interested and they forgot about it. But Bill Moore wrote this book, The Roswell Incident, and out of the woodworks, came many characters who started to claim that in 1947, they indeed saw, uh, you know, uh, an alien entity in a, a hangar in Roswell, and that they witnessed some kind of a nurse walking around in a hangar, and, and then one guy, you know, he was a funeral director in Roswell, he said that, in one evening in 1947, he remembered getting a telephone call from the uh, Army Air Base requiring or requesting a baby casket, three or four baby caskets. And so people of all kinds who never spoke about the experiences in Roswell suddenly wanted to come into the limelight. And so they came up in droves they were seeking for some kind of a fame. And so that began the uh, Roswell disinformation stuff in 1980 with William L. Moore, who admitted that he was a disinformant, uh, disinformation agency. He testified this in 1993, uh, Las Vegas MUFON conference, he admitted. And, you know, in 1980, a lot of things happened at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. In 1980, William Moore visited an AFOSI, Air Force Office of Special uh, Investigation. Uh, this counterintelligence officer named Richard C. Doty, so William Moore, or Bill Moore, visited Richard C. Doty at Kirtland Air Force Base in 1989, and they are the ones who started this whole campaign of propagating disinformation throughout the UFO community. That took place at Kirtland Air Force Base in 1980. And, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, Richard C. Doty, who has become well known in the UFO community as an official disinformation agent. Uh, but uh, actually, he was doing a job that he thought was necessary, uh, which is to uh, distract attention from people who were scrutinizing the activities at Kirtland Air Force Base in the 1980s, early 1980s, because there were a lot of people living in Albuquerque who were beginning to watch some strange lights hovering over the secret Manzano nuclear storage facility inside Kirtland Air Force Base. And they were watching these strange objects, strange plasma-like objects hovering over the Manzano nuclear storage facility. And so 
It was the job of Richard C. Doty as a counterintelligence officer to deflect this scrutiny. And so he decided to convince this scientist by the name of Paul Benowitz to, uh, to, to uh, turn his uh, attention to Northern New Mexico instead of Kirtland Air Force Base. And that was the beginning of the long history of the uh, Delta base rumors. And, uh, you, you know, uh, I am so uh, fortunate uh, that uh, recently I became friends with uh, Richard C. Doty, the former AFOSI agent of Kirtland, uh, because I used to write derogatory articles about Richard C. Doty saying that he was no good, saying that he was a uh, disinformant, uh, official disinformant and all that, you know. But I began to realize that he was doing his job as a counterintelligence officer because he was interested in protecting a national, uh, you know, uh, important national uh, weapons programs. And so, I became friends with him just uh, since uh, two months ago, only two months ago. Until then, he hated me because I used to write terrible articles about him. And But uh, I decided that, well, we need to listen to his side of the story. So I'm a person who wants to listen to both sides of any story. It's very important as a, as a conspiratologist. I like to uh, listen to both sides of the story. So I decided to invite him to speak in Albuquerque next Saturday, June 8th, in a public library in Albuquerque. And uh, so I'm so excited that he decided not only to that he became friends with me, but he decided to accept my invitation uh, you know, to be the special guest speaker at this forum called the New Mexico U Forum, UFO R U M. It's a forum to discuss about this UFO phenomenon. So I am a leader of New Mexico U Forum, and we meet periodically at the public library called Cherry Hills Public Library in Albuquerque. So uh, Richard C. Doty will speak for two hours. I give him two hours to say anything he wants to say uh, in this UFO forum meeting at Cherry Hills Public Library on Saturday, June the 8th from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. and the public is invited. It's an open meeting. And so I am not sure how many people will show up because a lot of people seem to dislike uh, Richard C. Doty because he was, he's no good and he's just telling lies all the time and and he's a disinformant and this and that. But, you know, as I said, every person should be given an opportunity to, to uh, you know, say his side of the story. So I'm looking forward to Mr. Richard Doty speak next week right here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh, that's going to be so interesting to see what he has to say. I'm curious myself. Yes, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people just hear things. And, uh, of course, there, there are some good video programs that uh, Richard C. Doty was in. In fact, uh, one great documentary movie is called Mirage Man. Mirage Man. It is an hour and a half documentary movie featuring Richard C. Doty. And Richard C. Doty is a person that doesn't speak at conferences usually, very little. But, uh, you know, in this documentary film called The Mirage Man, he speaks very openly about his role in all of this in ufology. And so, you know, we're going to see what he's going to say to us 
uh, in the public library uh, next weekend on Saturday. So I'm just fascinated. Oh, that's yeah, me too. I, I'm going to email you to find out what he says because <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> Very wow. Good. Yes. yes. Oh, my goodness. I'm curious, though, why do you think some of these, um, uh, I guess, unidentified flying objects show themselves to certain people or, yeah, show themselves for, to certain people? Some people can see them and some people cannot. Why you is that? You said it right. You said it right. This is the reason why, first of all, the name UFO is a misnomer. Uh, UFO simply means unidentified flying objects, but actually it's a misnomer because we still don't know if they're flying or if they are even objects. So the Pentagon realized this terrible misnomer and they changed recently. Uh, they no longer use the word uh, UFOs. They began to use the word unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAP, but they also just recently further changed that definition to unidentified anomalous phenomenon, UAP, it's still UAP, but their definition is right now unidentified anomalous phenomenon. That includes anything, anything because it's a phenomenon that we still don't know. It's just like, uh, it's almost like a, a paranormality or paraphysicality. And uh, you were talking about, uh, yeah, I don't know what you were trying to go with this, but uh, you know, uh, so that's the position right now. The Pentagon has, uh, you know, made very few statements but there are some people in our government that are convinced that uh, this phenomenon is real. And so, <clears throat> you know, the U.S. Congress uh, had a special uh, public uh, session last July 2023. And uh, there were several former so-called intelligence officers who testified that the United States has been hiding actual alien artifacts. But the problem is that we still have no physical evidence. Where is the physical evidence for all these statements coming from the so-called intelligence officers? Not even one, because it's most likely that there are no physical, tangible objects to show for it. It's all just talk and talk and talk. And so <clears throat> the United States uh, government is definitely interested in, uh, in all of these things. But uh, you know, it's the problem of uh, spending how much money of our tax dollars to research on something that's realistic. Uh, but uh, you know, there's a case already a few years ago our hard tax during a tax uh, earned tax dollars were used to do research on some very very dubious programs they took 22 million dollars which is not much it's nothing it's a pocket change 22 million dollars of our hard earned tax dollars to investigate uh, a ranch in Utah called the Skinwalker Ranch. And you don't have to spend $22 million to come to the conclusion that there are paranormal activity in certain areas. You don't have to spend $22 million. All you have to do is go to places, even right now, go to places like Dulce, New Mexico, and you can probably experience some kind of paranormality. So this is my concern. You know, as I said, I'm a, a believer in the beneficent use of our hard-earned tax dollars. And I'm, by the way, a firm believer in the importance of 
facilities like Area 51 or a national defense. I mean, our hard-earned tax dollars are being used for legitimate programs such as the ones that are going on in Area 51 because it's for a national defense. So I'm all for that. But I am not for uh, spending our hard-earned tax dollars to investigate things that we can investigate ourselves. <laughs> so that is my position. So some people can see these UFOs or UAPs, and some people cannot. And some people claim that they get abducted. Are those, I don't know, what, what, what do you think is going on with that? Well, this is the important thing, uh, Maya, that uh, you brought this, <clears throat> because we're talking about reality. Now, reality is a relative terminology. We don't really know what reality really is, because every single individual on this planet has their own reality. Every single individual living in this world lives in their own world, and we cannot possibly go into the minds of another individual to see that person's reality, because this is another thing. <clears throat> you know, some people claim that they were abducted by alien entities, and I believe that they were. In their reality, they were abducted by these entities. Uh, so who is to say that they are telling lies? Well, maybe some of them are, but many of them may not be telling their lies. They really believe that they were abducted physically by these alien entities in their reality. So, you know, that's my position. We still don't know what reality is. So that's another area of uh, study to find out what reality really is. But I believe it's impossible to get to the bottom of what reality is. We, we, we have no idea what reality is. So that is the best answer I can give right now. That's true. You're right. Absolutely. Well, um, I guess in this conclusion, I believe you said that l these things are not all malevol malevolent. Some are benevolent. Um, is there any final message that you'd like to convey to the audience about the importance of maybe maintaining an open mind while also being critical of evidence presented in the field of UAPs and paranormal research? Well, I can say this, you know, uh, we just, our level of scientific knowledge is limited to, uh, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> what do you call it, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the study of science is limited. And so in the future, as science improves, we may know more about quantum physics and other uh, types of uh, uh, physics. But at this point in time, we just have uh, so much limitations on what we know. And uh, so, you know, you just keep on trying. But uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that in this vast universe, the distance alone is so just mind boggling that we're looking at stars in the sky that are emitting lights from possibly millions or billions of years ago. So right now, they may not be there. So, you know, this is the point. The universe is so humongous that we don't know. It's almost impossible for the physical object in our scientific knowledge to go from one point in this tremendous universe to another point in this universe, it's almost impossible, even with the speed of light, to travel that distance uh, in the speed of light without 
causing total physical change in the structure of the person or the machine that travels such a long distance. But as I said, you know, uh, we just don't know uh, because uh, if uh, uh, civilization is uh, billions of years advanced than us, maybe they might have uh, overcome how to uh, jump from one point in the space to another point instantaneously. We don't know because we haven't reached that point yet. But as I said, you know, uh, what we're seeing in the stars in the night sky are millions of years old, you know. Uh, so it takes 18 minutes for the sun to reach the sunlight to, to our Earth. 18 minutes. <laughs> that long, you know, 18 minutes. So you don't see it instantaneously. That's how spacious this whole uh, space is. And uh, so we just don't understand, but we have to put faith in the, the human uh, potential. And so this is the reason why I highly respect researchers and uh, physical theorists, such as Dr. Michio Kaku, who has, uh, you know, studied all these wonderful mysteries uh, of this universe, but has not come to a definite conclusion uh, because we are at a baby stage right now. So that's how it is right now. And my message, final message to the people is keep watching, keep watching. You never know. You never know because one of these days, suddenly there could be a disclosure by these entities globally to disclose themselves and to explain everything, but uh, we will never know when that day is gonna come. I have no confidence that the government will ever disclose anything because they don't know anything. The only disclosure will come from these entities, if they exist, themselves, to disclose themselves and to uh, create a new uh, mindset among the people. Will that day come? We don't know. It could be 10 years from now. It could be 20 years from now. It could be 100 years from now. Or it may never happen. I have no idea. So, but yet, we must always keep looking. And uh, that's my answer. <laughs> have you ever <laughs> met uh, Michio Kaku? Have you ever met him? Oh, it's impossible to uh, no. talk to such an amazing person. And, I know. Uh, so, uh, but... Uh, uh, I highly respect that uh, person, uh, Michio Me Kaku. too. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, Mia, I'm uh, so uh, absolutely fascinated and thankful for Thank you for having me uh, speak Thank you. wildly on your program. Absolutely. Uh, no, yeah. thank you. <laughs> where, where can our listeners find you and your work, your music? Where can we find yes. that? All they have to do is just do a Google search on Norio Hayakawa. Norio Hayakawa on Google, and you can probably find uh, tens of thousands of articles that I have written or any item that I have, I have written. Or, uh, you know, you can also use a YouTube and go, uh, you know, to Norio Hayakawa, and I have produced. Uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of short YouTube videos. I am a believer that YouTube videos should be short, you know, and not long. And so I have made many, many, many short two or three minutes uh, YouTube videos on UFOs and conspiracies and all that. And I try to summarize everything in my video. So People can also write to me by email at noriohayakawa at gmail.com. 
NorioHayakawa at gmail.com and I will answer every single question that people may have and I will do my best to answer to the best of my knowledge and to the best of my ability. Oh, thank you so much. Chikano itadaite arigato gozaimasu. Doitashimashite. Doitashimashite. Honto ni kanchan shimashite. Arigato. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, it was a pleasure to meet you. I, I really am well, so happy that I got to meet you. Thank oh, you so much. Great, Mia-san. Great. Okay, thank we'll you. talk to you again. Yeah. And that brings us to an end of another episode of the Sensible Hippie Podcast. I want to thank my special guest, Norio Hayakawa, for sharing his incredible insights and experiences with us today. Listeners, if you've enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to follow the podcast, leave a five-star rating, and write a positive review. Your support means the world to us, and it's the only way people will find us. When you subscribe and you leave reviews, it helps reach more listeners and attract more incredible guests. Amazing individuals like Norio Hayakawa, L.A. Marzuli, Brian Peterson, Gary Wayne, they're all excited to join us because they see that there is an engaged audience out there. So by following and reviewing, you're helping to grow our ohana and bring even more fascinating content and remarkable guests to the show. So until the next time, remember, in the world of UAPs, the truth is out there just waiting to be revealed. Ahui ho kako. Bye. I got another chance to rise above the emptiness. Got a brand new plan for my like a silhouette. Our eyes are looking up, gonna get what we want. Looking up, gonna get what we want